Hello, Mr. Microphone. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Hello and welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner. And I am Tony Schmidt. And today, Tony, let's begin with listener mail. It's not really mail, it's comments. Messages. Messages. Listener messages. First, listener Psy1, who has been a listener for a long time. You, you know that they're a dedicated listener when you recognize the name of the handle. Yeah. Anyway, Cy One writes uh, about a documentary about the atom bomb. This is because in the last episode about the environment, we talked about the left's aversion to nuclear power and how uh, it's not necessarily grounded in science, but uh, we speculated that it could be a connection to an opposition to nuclear war. And uh, Cy comments that there's a great documentary about the atom bomb and its creation. It's called A is for Atom, and it's by a man named Adam Curtis. Huh. Funny name, right? Uh, and that the, it goes through the history of nuclear power and the concerns of the engineers working on the project, both in the USSR, in the Soviet Union, and in the West. Uh, and shows that the authorities on both sides were not being completely honest with their findings. So, a documentary to check out if you want to know more about the history of nuclear power. Yeah, and I will also say, um, I, I read a, I think it's aimed at uh, young adults, a nonfiction book called Bomb, uh, that goes through the Manhattan Project, and that's also a pretty good and interesting one it's a really easy read because it's aimed at teenagers and stuff but good and informative about that i'll cool. recommend that along with this documentary that i will have to check out uh we have another listener whose handle on the reddit is that username is all ray which i assume i'm supposed to understand is that username is already taken uh. probably but there's not enough syllables anyway comments that uh, he or she likes that we apply Marxist theory to pop culture and has a suggestion for us. Because you remember that we did the episode on the B movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, we'll probably do some future movies as well. Uh, this listener recommends the movie Box Trolls, which we looked up and was on Netflix when we checked. So if you're a Netflix subscriber... Maybe check out Box Trolls, because who knows? It might be an episode at some time. And I have seen this movie, and I, I think, yes, it would make a... Oh, you've already seen it, so I just need yeah, to catch up. I have kids. <laughs> so, yeah. I've seen it. It's, it's a cute movie, but, yeah, the messaging is definitely something we could dig into. Pretty good. And should. Rufus Stultus writes to us about Joe... McCarthy's grave up in Appleton. Remember, we talked about this with Colby because yep. he was trying to figure out what to do in Wisconsin. And uh, somehow we, we talked about McCarthyism and we suggested that he could go up to McCarthy's grave and make his video there if he wanted to. Because yeah. that is in Wisconsin. Uh, Rufus writes that on a, a past May Day, he and a friend went to McCarthy's grave to fly the red flag over his grave. Uh, and they did so. And the one of the folks at the cemetery, the caretaker looks like, uh, asked them to leave because it was they were on pro private property. Rufus comments that it was very interesting that that was the particular uh, rule he chose to appeal to. Uh, but that they did leave peacefully and wished the caretaker a happy May Day. So there's there's another idea of something you could do on McCarthy's grave. One other announcement. We had a request from a listener. I'm going to go with the pronunciation Gare. 
on this one. And Gare asked if uh, we were on Stitcher. And at the time, the answer was no. But now, because of you, Gare, we have uh, got our podcast on Stitcher. So you can now find us and listen to us on Stitcher. That's it for listener mail. Listener messages. Yeah, and if you'd like to send us a message, connect with us, you can do that over on the WordPress at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com or the Reddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday, all one word. And yeah, if you leave us a message there or a comment or send us a message, uh, yeah. We, we, I try and check them and respond and stuff. If we don't respond to stuff, we do see it. We look at everything. There's a, a nice long good list of suggestions for episodes. And if you suggested something and wondering why we haven't done that, it's because you have a very good suggestion that we are not necessarily super knowledgeable about yet. So, uh, it's something that we, uh, endeavor to educate ourselves on so that we can discuss it we love to hear from you so just with any comments or thoughts we like hearing those so send them our way i have a couple of uh comments i wanted to make about other podcasts sometimes we do this not to get too cat fighty or something i don't think any they don't listen to no, us. No, no one it's listens so... to us. So sometimes, yeah. If you listen to us, I feel like there's a good chance that you might listen to other popular podcasts. And a couple of interesting things came up. One, this isn't a, well, I don't know if it's a popular podcast or not, but I discovered another socialist podcast, Tony. Oh, yeah? Which one? It is called Socialist Visions. Socialist Visions. I have not heard of this. It is, I believe, a live recorded radio show that gets put out as a podcast. Okay. And the interesting thing is, these uh, the hosts of it recently did an episode on the Black Panthers. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And uh, these guys are, I believe the hosts are from uh, an earlier generation than us. Uh, the one guy was saying that he just missed the draft for the Vietnam War. Uh, so they have kind of a different perspective on it. And, and actually they know some of the guys, the, you know, they ran into him and, and know some of the guys that were in the Panthers. So I think you should think of our episode as an introduction to the Panthers. And then if you want, you could check out the Socialist Vision episode on, uh, the Panthers, and find out a little bit more if you want to know more. The other comment on other podcasts, I know you haven't been listening to this one recently, but the Hello Internet podcast, hosted by CPG Gray and Brady Heron of YouTube fame. They had a moment in their last episode where they talked about the Magna Carta <laughs> and how it was valued at... 24 million pounds, I think, is the number. The okay. specific number doesn't matter. They had an interesting comment where uh, Gray said that he didn't think it was actually worth that much and commented that just because somebody pays so much for something doesn't mean that that's how much it's really worth, which was, I thought, an interesting comment. And as the conversation progressed, Brady Heron said that uh, well, they both, let me back up. As the conversation progressed, they both agreed that the Magna Carta is indeed priceless, that no value could be assigned to it because, this is very interesting, the reason because, because it was non-reproducible. It was a unique item. And Brady then took the stance that all non-reproducible items are similarly priceless that you cannot assign a value to them because they are just unique things and gray wasn't ready to agree to that point but i thought it was very interesting that these two gentlemen uh who i believe to consider 
basically laymen in economics. I don't think that either of them are folks that study economics, yeah. but just kind of coming at it from a common sense point of view, came to a conclusion that is essentially equivalent to Marx's labor theory of value. That if you cannot reproduce an item, that there's no way to assign a real value to it because its value is the value it takes in human labor to reproduce it. Yeah, that's interesting. Especially because I feel like I did actually listen to an older episode of theirs recently. Um, and they were talking about an episode of The Black Mirror TV show, which sounds interesting. Um, and I, I thought their critique of it was interesting because they didn't realize that the episode was very clearly a critique of capitalism. Um, cause it was about like, consumption and people consuming nonsense goods and like virtual goods and whatnot and working all this that and everything yeah mm -hmm. yep, I, won't I remember get, that okay i won't get into it but I, I thought it was interesting they had a lot of interesting thoughts about it but they just somehow completely missed like they even got that it was a critique of like media and stuff and consumption of media, but missed that it was a, uh, a critique of capitalism, or at least to me it seemed very, almost heavy-handedly a critique of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, in a way that's almost embarrassing for us Marxists. You know, if you make something too heavy-handed, then it kind of seems like maybe it's not such a great work of art. Although I, I can't judge, because I haven't actually seen Black Mirror. I did, however, listen to that episode where... <laughs> these two non-Marxists interpreted it, and it was clear for me from their interpretation that it was, in fact, uh, a piece of anti-capitalist art. Which maybe now that means that we need to watch it sometime. Probably, yeah. Something to add to the list. <laughs> it is very interesting, the phenomenon of people intuitively or kind of accidentally tapping into marxist ideas without realizing it well it shows that you know unlike traditional neoclassical economics like marx's stuff not only makes good logical sense but it's just grounded in common sense as opposed to saying things have value because people just decide they have value and thus they have value it's you know more obvious that well it doesn't necessarily have value if it does like like with the uh less extreme example than something like the magna carta is if i can sell you a you know fork for a million dollars it doesn't mean that the fork is worth a million dollars nobody would think that they would just think that you were a fool for buying it for a million dollars mm -hmm. so whereas capitalist economics well, I guess they'd probably go into more of a supply and demand thing, but they would say if there's a demand for people to pay, uh, you know, if the demand is high enough for that, they could be worth a million dollars. And Oh, yeah. And that if you use that person as an example, maybe they really are. And Okay, next topic. I want to introduce a recurring topic that we will do from time to time. Uh, I want to call this Manifesto Minute. And this is where we will look at a small part of the Communist Manifesto and discuss it. In much longer than a minute, probably. Yes. Because <laughs> we're just too long-winded to do it in a minute. <laughs> Although that almost, that'd be a challenge. This Time challenge. Yeah, I know. This, is, <laughs> this one's long enough. It might be a minute to just read the su section. We're going to read a paragraph. I think it would be good for us to start with just mentioning the manifesto and what it's all about. Written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in 1848. Yeah, I think they wrote it in late 1847 and it was published in 1848. Um, and no, didn't spark off the 1848 rebellions. <laughs> um, it might have influenced some of them, but I don't think it was widely circulated enough at that point. And it was something that they were hired to write. This was actually, like, a little job that they got paid for. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the manifesto, even though it was written over 160 years ago, is 
in many ways a very modern document. It's amazing. Find any other piece of text written in the mid 1800s and try to find something that is as applicable to today's situation as the manifesto. I think the language has changed a little bit, but the things that are happening have not necessarily changed that much. Yeah, actually, for texts that old, the language is pretty approachable still, even. That's true. It could be a lot worse. Yeah, like Capital Volume 1. <laughs> so the selection that we've uh, picked for today is uh, about the historical transformation out of feudalism into capitalism. Uh, which is an interesting transformation and something I think that's important for us socialists to keep in mind. Because what's important for us is to understand, one, that economic systems do change and do transform. That capitalism has not been the economic system throughout all of history, despite what capitalists will tell you. And that... These changes have happened, and understanding how they change and what comes with each change is an important part of understanding our world. Yeah. Also, I'm just going to throw in, with the the capitalism existing forever, just because money existed previously doesn't mean that was capitalism. Just because banks existed previously does not mean it was capitalism. Just because people sold goods doesn't mean it was capitalism. Capitalism is a very specific economic form where uh, commodities are produced for sale in order for the owner of the means of production to get an increase in their money through this commodity production. And the vast majority of workers in that society cannot provide for themselves with their own means and must sell their labor to these capitalists. Like, it's very concrete in that, so... It just always really bugs me when people are like, well, trade existed, Zents, and it's like, no, that's not the point. Yes, people made goods and sold them, but it wasn't Yeah, and even if they did it with form. money, doesn't mean that they had the employer-employee relationship. It doesn't mean that they had private ownership in the means of production or that the means of production were concentrated yeah. uh, into into the hands of the few. Right. I mean, you, you can argue that that's the beginning of starting to see shifts when that stuff happens, and that's true because there's no fine line where there's capitalism and then there's not. It's a gradual change over time. Yep. But, sorry, I just, that always irritates me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's learn more about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. This is from the manifesto. It is the section called Proletarians and the Bourgeoisie. It is the section called Bourgeois and Proletarians. In the edition that I have, it is paragraph 14. I think that that's probably the same in others. I don't know that people change the paragraphs. But for wording, if you're curious, I happen to be uh, using the Haymarket Books version, which is the annotated version by Phil Gasper. I have the public domain version, so I will follow along and tell you if there's any actual difference in wording. Okay. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put to end all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has piteously torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his, quote, natural superiors, unquote, and left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest than callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless, indefensible chartered freedoms, has set up the single, unconscion unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. That's the end of the quote. Do you want to comment on differences between the versions? Uh, there is not the it has substituted at the very last sentence. Otherwise, that was identical. Oh, all right. So the... what What is... 
the point of this paragraph? What is Marx saying in it? Essentially, he's getting at the fact that under feudalism, there was all of this kind of mysticism and kind of hiding of the economic system, right? right? That the, well, maybe we should start at the very beginning with defining the economic system of feudalism, right? We had the basic setup was you had serfs and nobles, and the serfs did all of the work and paid an homage to the noble, oftentimes based on the land being divided up. They might work three days on their own land, and then they might work three days on the land of the Lord and then have like a day for rest or something like that. But it was very clear, uh, at least, you know, when you were working for yourself versus when you were working for the Lord. But at the same time, it was all veiled with this, this religious sense of duty, of this is your place in life, this is what God wants. It wasn't, you know, a deal, I'll do this to help myself, and you'll also get something out of it. It was, you know, the way of the world. Yeah, the divine right of kings to rule. and yeah. Yep, exactly. And what capitalism did was it took away all of that religious structure around the economy. When capitalism came along, it did not justify itself by saying, okay, God wants these people to be capitalists and these people to be workers. You know, it was just based on who owned what and and everyone was free to choose who to work for and those who owned the means of production were free to choose who to hire, which was a big change from from feudalism. You know, the serfs were tied to the land and the lord managed that land. Yeah, you couldn't, if your lord was brutal, you couldn't go... Okay, you couldn't easily up and leave and go somewhere else. I mean, I'm sure it happened, but it was far the exception. So this is Marx outlining just the the difference between these two systems to say that feudalism had chivalry and religious duty and all of these uh all of these ideological constructs around it. And in this paragraph, it almost comes off that capitalism is not uh, shrouded in ideology. Right. Well, I take it to be not shrouded in silly mystical ideology, although Mm -hmm. even that, I think you could argue against that, though, because, I mean, what is the invisible hand of the market other than mysticism? Right. Yeah, I think that we can say that, in comparison, capitalism has far less religious ideology than feudalism does. But, uh, like a good manifesto, it overstates the case just a little bit. Yeah. And that's, I I think that's a nature of the, of, of the form here. Although, you could argue that maybe he is hitting the ideology a little bit with the uh, the replacing everything uh, with the in the icy waters of egotistical calculation because that's something that I notice a lot especially in my classes about economics is there's a shaky foundation for stuff but it all gets buried upon calculations and I don't know if it has a term but there's a sort of human cognitive bias that if you can calculate something it seemed to be true that's how you it's really easy to lie with numbers and stuff is that well i'm better at this because one plus one equals two and yeah the two is higher than nothing so yeah 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 it's the the numbers don't lie fallacy yeah. Oh, is that what it's called? Well, I don't know. I'm just... I like the name for that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. There's... That's the... right. Write it down right now. Red Wagner came up with the numbers don't lie fallacy. Um, but, <laughs> you know, that's... I, I, honest, I mean, that is really how capitalism, I think, ideologically really works a lot these days. Like, if you watch any of the inane business news, they're always talking about the stock market and the Dow Jones Industrial Average which sounds so fancy and so concrete, and oh my god, it's down a thousand points. Oh yay, it's up a hundred. When really it's taking 
like the 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 stock prices of the like 500 biggest companies that trade on that uh on that in that market and just basically averaging the number i mean it's more mm-hmm. complicated than that but it's essentially all they're doing, and it really doesn't yeah. capture much of the market because those 500 companies can be the only thing doing poorly. 100% of all of the other companies can be, you know, just up great, and people will think the economy is doing bad. But, I mean, even the price of a stock, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's just a number that's based upon what people want, are willing to buy and sell based upon their feeling about what's happening but you throw a number on it and people pretend there's a reason and that's that's what drives the economy there's an interesting contradiction when it comes to the reporting and the interpretation of stocks at one point it's capitalist economics would say that the way you know the value of a company is by how much it sells for and then that tells you that oh okay the you know they're ascribing to this capitalist idea that you know that price that they announce or the 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 how much the dow is up or down is exactly equal to its value but then do you ever notice this that after a uh, a big dip or or a small crash they'll say oh it was the market readjusting yep which at the same time is them saying that the old number was not right, that we had to do an adjustment. It had to come down because the old number was wrong. Well, if the old number was wrong, then how do you know the value? Because now you're saying that the value is not what people would pay for it. Yeah, that's the thing that sort of drives me nuts about the supply and demand curves that capitalists are so fond of, is that it's never... Like the so price is supposed to come when supply and demand are equal to each other. That's how you figure out the price because people have a demand for five apples, and then there's a supply which maybe isn't five apples, which means people are willing to pay more. And then the idea is it's sort of a feedback system, and that is if people are demanding five apples and there's only three, well then uh, next time they go to market they'll have five, but then maybe the demand is four. And the problem with that is it's never actually lining up. It's always chasing after each other's sort of echoes of a signal. And it's it's a very unstable thing. Like they talk about equilibrium prices a lot when they're – when you're like doing calculations. But really an equilibrium price is – one, doesn't ever actually happen. And two – doesn't tell you anything it's just a price it's just a number Mm -hmm. once it's settled it's settled and it doesn't make any difference but it's this constant chasing after its own tail as it were yeah i think the to to the second of your two points there what david harvey says is that when supply and demand are in equilibrium then they cease to explain anything yeah marx says that too that's Ah, capital volume one that's harvey quoting marx yeah yeah. Me quoting Harvey quoting Marx. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, al- along, those same, <laughs> along those same lines, to your first point that they aren't ever in equilibrium, I think that this is also one of the causes of capitalist crisis. If you, for example, have a lack of apples, like you were saying, well, let, let's go with a better example, one that you could turn around quickly, because... You're not going to grow a mature apple tree in one year. But let's say uh, athletic shoes or something like that. Uh, If all of a sudden there was a massive demand for athletic shoes and the price went up, then everyone that makes athletic shoes would realize, oh, we can make a lot of money. The profit margin on athletic shoes is quite high right now. So every single producer of athletic shoes may, in the next production cycle make more shoes and when they do so there will be then the in that next production cycle a glut of shoes and the price will have to fall because of that it is you know the the shortage produces the glut in the next cycle because none of these capitalists are coordinating with each other right you know no they're not all saying okay next year there's probably going to be this much so how are we going to all divide up the the work to meet that demand 
that's not how capitalism works that in in fact if that is how capitalism works if it ever if that ever does happen in capitalism is what i should say that is collusion that that's uh a thing that's against the law because uh the, they'll probably be because the reason they'd be doing it it would be to keep prices uh artificially high yeah like um good examples of that the libor rigging uh scandal where they were rigging this exchange value so that they could all lock in the best deals that they could get. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's something else that I think we should point out about this. Is this is Marx isn't a hundred percent against capitalism. Okay, now let me rephrase that. It's a bad way to say. It. Marx isn't saying capitalism is one hundred percent negative. I think uh, that Marx. Part of what Marx is saying here is that capitalism, in a way, removed sort of a nonsensical mystical veil. Like, in getting rid of that, it laid bare the actual relations, and it got rid of a lot of this silly, old, outdated things that were very, very irrational. And I think Marx, that's something that, like technological innovation, Marx likes about capitalism. Because... Mm -hmm. It would be wrong to say capitalism is 100% purely evil and that it never did anything good for people. Mm -hmm. It has, and to some extent sometimes does, but we can do better than capitalism, is Marx's point, is that we can continue and go beyond it. Earlier in the manifesto, he calls capitalism the most revolu revolutionary force in history. Yeah. Which I think is a very good point to keep in mind. What capitalism did was, yeah, remove all of that religious mysticism so that people could see what was happening. That, that science could be ushered in, that technological innovation could be ushered in. And these are things that Marx is extremely in favor of. He believes in te technological innovation. He believes in science. In fact, I think it's Engels writes the pamphlet on scientific socialism later, which is yeah. a, 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 a term that they sometimes used for their particular brand, the Marx-Engels brand of socialism. There's a limitation to this quote that I want to bring up. And that's, I think, the idea that the exploitation is entirely visible, that it's totally naked, that everyone can see the exploitation going on. In feudal society, the exploitation was actually more visible if you were to look at when you were doing labor for yourself versus when you were doing labor for the Lord. Because there was literally different plots of land. Sometimes, you know, in, in Western Europe that was often the case, but not everywhere. In capitalism, you go to work for the whole day and you get your or for the two weeks or whatever, and you get your paycheck at the end. And there's no moment at which you can say, ah, now is when I am doing the work for to make my paycheck, and now is when I am doing the work that produces the value for my employer. There's, there's no way to separate that. So I think that's one part of capitalism. That's, that's the way that capitalism hides it. And it does it in this very... Like, like Mark says, this callous cash payment way, this self-interested way, you can make this much money if you work for me. That's the callous cash payment. That's the self-interest. But hidden underneath there is the fact that the, the thing that the employer does not tell you, which is, I'm making more than that based on the work that you're doing. That even though I'm paying you $15 an hour, I'm making a lot more than that for every hour that you work. And that's the reason I'm paying you $15 an hour. And on top of that, I think there is also an additional ideology. It's not just that the employer fails to tell you that, but there is an ideology of, of uh, for example, the Protestant work ethic, which uh, I'm not sure Protestant is any longer the right adjective for it 
I think it's something that's often celebrated here in America and probably other capitalist nations as well, is working hard is fulfilling your duty as a good citizen. Like, you know, that's it's not a question uh, of, you know, callous self-interest. Do you want to work hard and make a lot of money or do you not want to work and not make money? You know, that would be the callous calculation, right? Yeah. Is you could just choose equally either one. But there, it's not just that. It's not that those are two equal choices. One of those two choices is celebrated in our culture, in our media, in our politicians' speeches, in the news channels. In sliming grease. Yep. I, yeah. get, I hear that work a lot. That's something that actually I hear a lot from people is taking pride at how much more work Americans do than other nations. Which is kind of insane to me in that one that's pretty uh, racist or xenophobic. Um, And two, I don't know that it should be celebrated in any way, shape, or form that instead of taking nice vacations and retiring earlier, we work harder and longer (laughs) than anyone else. Like, that sort of seems like something that, to me, we should bemoan as opposed to celebrate. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a it's a sick and twisted kind of ideology that causes I mean you can tell that it is a strong part of our ideology because anytime you want to demonize someone you can call them lazy. You know, this is one of the basic tools of the most primitive kinds of racism. If you want to demonize a whole race you say that race is intrinsically lazy because we we um, value hard work. We put ha- hard work up on this pedestal, and and anyone that doesn't want to work is somehow evil or not fully human or just undeserving in some way. And it, so I think that's one one way that you can see that it's a clear ideology for us. And like you mentioned, it's particularly sick when we think oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had more vacation and someone else says, no, it's good that we work hard. You know, take pride in the fact that I don't take my vacation days. It's like, you know, what are what are you thinking? Like, the, the, so you're going to celebrate the fact that you work hard for your employer and and say that that's in some way better than developing, like, a strong relationship with your family or... Or, you know, developing your per- yourself as a, like, uh, interesting, well-rounded person, an informed citizen. You know, aren't all of these other things uh, also of value or maybe not even higher value to be an informed citizen, to be someone that, you know, fights for justice and maintains their family and social relations? The other thing about this quote that stands out is the single right that Marx cites, which is free trade. And it is very interesting how in our modern society, we do have a number of rights that uh, we have written into law. In the U.S., it would be in the amendments of the Constitution that we have certain rights, the Bill of Rights. But any time these rights seem to come up against free trade, you know, the the right of a wealthy person to spend their money however they wish and to make more money, it seems like those rights are always compromised for that first and most fundamental right of capitalism, which is the right of private property, of those who own the means of production to to continue increasing their value and and to maintain the exploitation of others. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, if you look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, part of what's in there is that if a nation, say, Ecuador, we'll say, because other country that has rainforests, I know off the top of my head, if they make it illegal to cut down trees in the rainforest, without some, like, replanting, or I don't know exactly what sort of things people set up for that. Uh, but, you know, make it illegal to just clear-cut rainforest. A corporation can sue them for loss of profit that they would have made on the, those trees. 
and they get to go to a court where the judges are industry lawyers, <laughs> and then the court can fine them, or I believe even just allow uh, that company to blatantly violate the laws that were laid down in that nation, just completely circumvent any and all uh, environmental laws. Another good example of free trade being the primary right of our capitalist society is the Citizens United case, where the Sup Supreme Court of the U.S. decided that uh, any entity, including corporations, can spend as much as they want on political uh, advertising during campaigns. So you... You know, you can't literally pay someone to vote one way or the other. That one's still illegal. But you can pay to inundate the population with message after message after message, convincing them not to vote for your opponent and convincing them to vote for you. Yeah. You can't tell people, vote for this person, but you can make sure they don't know there's anyone else to vote for. Now, the interesting thing is that the Supreme Court said that it was not the right of free trade that allowed that to happen. They called it the right of free speech. However, I think they've confused the two because spending money is not really speech as you and I understand speech. Spending money is free trade. Well, I'm going to go out on a, a nice, perhaps not so limb and say there might have been some free speech their way to make them do that. <laughs> seen as... Clarence Thomas has appeared at, like, Koch brother retreats, and his wife is a lobbyist as well. It wouldn't shock me. There's no conflict of interest there is what you're saying. No, never. Never with any of the Supreme Court justices. Okay. Just like the... Sorry. No, now I have to bring up the... Okay. Here's another good example. So, our idiot governor... I mean, illustrious governor... Uh, Scott Walker uh, had been investigated uh, for blatant illegal campaign finance stuff. Um, and there had been an investigation going on into that. And Club for Growth for Wisconsin, which is a conservative, I believe it's a, I don't know if it's a political action committee or just a group. But it's a conservative group that puts a lot of money towards elections. Uh had been suing to get it removed because they were one of these people doing illegal campaign stuff. And so the Wisconsin Supreme Court is a little different in that they're actually elected um, officials. Uh, and one of the people who helps the majority conservatives win is the Club for Growth. So the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, who the majority are conservative and also receive money from the Club for Growth, were allowed to decide that this investigation should be thrown out and all documents destroyed because it looks bad for the Wisconsin Club for Growth who funds their campaigns. So that's that's a that's a good example of uh of how that sort of free speech slash free trade works. Mm-hmm. Massive, blatant corruption. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S C H M I T T A J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, MarxismTodayPodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others 
on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Marxism today. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.